go. So, good morning. Actually, good afternoon, everyone. It's a little hazy, you know, not working and all that fun stuff. But, if you don't know who I am, my name's Nick. Some of you may know me as Nature Nick. I was asked by Muster Scout Reservation to do a little video cast for you today on the bear advancement, fur feathers, and ferns. Uh, this is primarily for bears, but you just need something to do today. Stop on by, check out the video. So, there are seven requirements for this advancement. The first advancement is mandatory. After requirement one, you can choose three of the remaining six. Uh, we are going to go through all seven of them, give you some helpful hints, some pointers, and some tips. And if you notice, I've got some demonstrations for you and some talking points. So we'll jump right into it. Requirement number one is to go on a one mile hike. But on your hike, you gotta find six signs of wildlife. It says mammals, birds, reptiles, insects, or plants. Uh, haven't quite figured out how you find a sign of a plant other than maybe it's seed pod or actually looking at it. But we're gonna talk about some of the other things that are a little harder. Now, it says signs of an animal. And if you look at requirement number four, you have to observe an animal. Now, number one, seeing an animal doesn't count, but on number four, it does. So, some ways you can find out if an animal's actually in the area is footprints. So, I am pulled out my handy dandy little possum foot. I think everyone has one of these laying around the house, right? Well, when an animal's walking along a creek bed looking for food, like our adorable little marsupial friend here, he's walking along the creek bed and he steps in the mud, well, he's gonna leave a footprint. And every animal has a different skeletal structure and leaves its own footprint. So if you found a possum footprint, you'll be able to tell the difference than a raccoon or a skunk. And especially a deer, you know, they pretty much stand out. If you don't feel like walking up and down creek beds and looking in mud, you can look in sand. The loose, light, small soil produces a better footprint. Snow in the winter months, which we didn't really have this year, uh, that's another good way to find footprints. Well, since I'm assuming you all can hear them, I'll just go on to the next way you can tell if an animal's in the area. My chickens have been clucking up a storm in the background. If you hear an animal, that also counts as a trace evidence. Songbirds, bullfrogs, green frogs, tree frogs, and the common toad, fun fact. The common toad sounds like the Jetson plane. Now, you scouts might not know who the Jetsons are, but your parents probably do. Now, hearing an animal's a great way. We have a lot of red-tailed hawks in Pennsylvania. They're always screeching up a storm. We got the songbirds out now. A lot of them coming back from vacation and down south. I know a lot of us aren't going to have a spring break, but they sure did. So they're back, flying around, and all that fun stuff. Now, birds also have feathers. Fun fact. I know a lot of you might not know that, but this is a ring-necked pheasant. Not native, but something fairly common in Pennsylvania. It's a popular game bird, but birds drop their feathers about twice a year. They get rid of their winter feathers and they get into their lighter, not as heavy spring and summer feathers. And then at the end of summer, they get into their warmer feathers. So at that time, when you find feathers, you'll be able to identify what birds are in the area as well. Uh, they don't always you know, drop them because they got to change for the seasons. Sometimes they get rid of the feather because it's beat up and a new one's growing in underneath. Now, not every animal has feathers. If you notice all these different mammals here, 
like our common red tail fox which here's the skull of, they have fur, our raccoon buddy has fur, our skunk, our coyote, our lovely white-tailed deer right down here, those are extremely common, and even this black fur right here which is a black bear, and our gray wolf. Now, or wolf, I actually don't know the exact species. Well, speaking of fur, my dog just came up to visit me. Aw, oh, he's hiding. But, animals run through the woods all the time. Deer go up trails, they go through thorn bushes, and it gets caught. And if you can find it, and use the internet with your parents' permission, and identify the different colorations, the banding, you'll be able to tell what animal's in the area. Now, since I did pull up a little bit of this, I'm going to move on to our next trace evidence, and that is bones. Every animal eventually does pass away. It's the circle of life and the food chain. So, this coyote skull, for example, here, if I was walking through the woods and found that, that would count as a sign that there was an animal in the area. Yeah. Same with our crows and our possums. So you can find these fairly common in PA if you know to look in the right places. So always keep an eye out. Now, I do recommend that if you do come across any bones or anything dead, uh, do not touch it without parents' permission. They can carry, you know, germs. We want to stay clean. We want to stay safe. Uh, make sure you follow your guidelines, you know, local laws and all that fun stuff when finding and picking things up. So, now all this has been cleaned, that's why it's safe for me to touch and all that, so do keep that in mind. But you should always leave what you find in the woods. Now, one of the more entertaining things to talk about as trace evidence, and that is scat. Yes, poop. Every animal does it. So, every animal does it differently. Squirrels like to do it in tiny little pellets. Foxes, since they eat more meat, you're going to notice they have fur and pieces of bone in it. Raccoons, they eat just about everything, so depending on what's what, you might see berries, you might see seeds. Our possums are more insectivores, eating up to about 6,000 ticks a single year. You're not really going to find the tick in the scat, but, you know, it's just something that's going to set it apart. You're not going to have the fur and you're not going to have the bone parts like the carnivores. Uh, possums are insectivores, so they're their scat's going to be a little more fine. Uh, deer, big kernels, things like that, with a lot of seeds. So, you, if you know what you're looking at, you might be able to identify what animals in the area based off of that. Hmm. Like I said earlier, sound. I can probably hear my neighbor's dog. So, now, not every bone that's left in the woods is something that has died. Right here is your common white-tailed deer antler. Um, they are from Buck, and if you notice, it's fairly smooth down here. That indicates that it fell off naturally. Uh, it's still a bone, it grows just kind of like the bones in our body and blood vessels going through it all that, but deer get rid of them every spring so they can grow bigger and better. So the next time you're able to go for a walk in the woods for about one mile, remember the requirements, Keep an eye out for those signs. Tracks, scat, calls, sounds, fur or feathers caught on a branch. Uh, oh, one thing I forgot to mention is if you even find the animal's nest, groundhog hole, a bird's nest, anything like that, it's a good thing to keep an eye out for. Now, we are going to move on to requirement number two. And like I said, two through seven, you have to choose which ones you want to do. You can choose you have to choose three of them but requirement two is to visit a zoo an aquarium a wildlife conservation a hatchery or an area of similarity now i understand not everyone's able to go outside right now and you know that will all change so one thing you could do to pass time is a lot of zoos and aquariums are actually offering online video tours uh it's not 
quite the same as going to the zoo and talking to the workers and reading all the signs, but it's a great thing to pass the time with and still highly educational. Um, it's better than watching Cartoon Network, you know. Dumball's a great show, but you need, to, you need some education in your life. Now, with that, you do have to go through and discuss what you learn. Well, you're going to be so breathtaking by all the beautiful animals and the exhibits and all the fun stuff there, that you might not know what to really look for when you're going to a zoo, an aquarium, or a wildlife conservation area. Um, so some points that you want to keep an eye out for on your visit is try to find the mission statement of said, you know, location that you're at. Uh, some zoos have strong conservation efforts for specific animals. Find out what animals. Find out what they're doing for it. Uh, if it's a wildlife rehabilitation center, find out what's the most common animal that comes in. If it's a wildlife sanctuary, is it a wetland sanctuary? Is it a hardwood forest sanctuary? Things like that. A lot of, oops, sorry, I heard a morning dove flying by. So, but these are things that you do want to keep in mind when you're going there. Uh, find out why it was founded. Maybe it was founded because someone, you know, with lots of money decided, I want to build a zoo because I love animals and show and spread their passion. Or maybe it was founded by the state because they realized one of our animals is in decline. Or that we have to protect our precious wetlands because all life comes from the water. Mosquitoes are important, but they do come from the wetlands. So, that's what you want to kind of look forward in number two. And keep it fun to talk about some of your favorite things, talk about your favorite animal, what some of the animals were doing, you know. All that fun stuff. Now we are going to go on to number three. Number three wants you to talk about which animals have gone extinct in the past 100 years. So as much as we love dinosaurs, a little bit longer than 100 years ago they died. Yeah, so can't talk about the dinosaurs. Um, before we go into exactly some animals that have gone extinct, I want to explain what the term extinct means. Uh, it's probably my least favorite word in the dictionary. It means that our cute, fuzzy, lovely little animals, and some of our creepy crawlies and scaly ones, you all know I love my snapping turtles, but they died off. Not snapping turtles, but in the term extinct, it means the animal has died off. There are no more living animals in the wild, or possibly captivity. Um, there are a couple different phases of extinction. Uh, you can go extinct in the wild, where the animal is no longer roaming around free, but we still have some in the zoos. Lonesome George, the famous Galapagos tortoise, for a while, they were extinct in the wild. There was only a handful of females and one male. Um, but when George passed away in the mid-2000s, he caused the full-blown extinction of his species. Uh, without a male and a female, they weren't able to build their numbers back up. Uh, so you could look up Lonesome George, parents' permission. Uh, you could discuss the Chinese paddlenose fish. Uh, we do have paddlenose fish in America, but they're a different species. Paddlenose are very large, prehistoric fish. They were actually around before the dinosaurs, and the American species is still around today. Unfortunately, in the past year, though, the Chinese paddlefish has been declared extinct in the wild, and I do believe there's none in captivity, which is a shame. Uh, well, before an animal gets extinct, they become endangered, and that just means their numbers are extremely low that they could very well die off. Uh, before that, they go into something called a species of cons or they go into threatened. Um, they're labeled as threatened, meaning their numbers are fairly high, but they're not that high. Like they very well could easily become endangered and then lead into extinction. Uh, after threatened, we move up to a species of concern. Not great, but better than the other options we have. It's something that we need to keep an eye on and possibly start doing conservation acts now before it gets too late. Um, things that cause animals to go extinct. Recently, a lot of human interaction. Um, 
Well, destroying their habitats, deforestation, pollution. There's a lot of trash in the oceans. Uh, chemical runoff. And even pesticides. Um, well, DDT wiped out a lot of our songbirds for a while and he almost made the American Eagle, the bald eagle, sorry, go extinct. Um, that was a very harmful pesticide and did a lot of damage. Uh, another thing humans have struggled with in the past is overhunting, hunting an animal to extinction. Uh, in our nation, we're very fortunate, we have a lot of conservation act um, activists and we take fairly good care of our, our game animals. So as long as people follow the regulations and they don't poach, poaching is illegal hunting. No matter your stance on hunting, we all agree poaching is absolutely horrible and we will not tolerate it. So we do want to crack down on that. Uh, one animal that went extinct recently uh, due to overhunting and poaching was the black rhino in Africa. Unfortunately, they are no longer around. There's still other species of rhinos, but they're also critically endangered. We do need to care about them. So, let's see, it covered over. Ah! One thing, I don't have anything to really show much about it, but disease. Um, diseases can harm animals and possibly cause extinction. One thing is with the Tasmanian tiger, they have tumors growing on their faces. It's some bacteria that's causing it and they're trying their hardest to find a cure for it, but their numbers have drastically dropped. Uh, the northern flying squirrel, we do have flying squirrels in PA. They're hard to find and we actually have flying squirrels at Muster Scout Reservation. They're the southern flying squirrel, not the northern. Uh, slight variation in the color of their fur, but the northern flying squirrel, they're getting attacked by a I think a bacterial infection. I, I gotta double check on that, but they are, they were being attacked and hit hard by a disease, and their numbers have dropped drastically. The southern flying squirrel, for some reason, even though they're so similar, is able to withstand it and is doing fine. Um, so that's one thing we do want to be mindful of, especially if you're over at Monster Scout Reservation. Um, you know, don't tap on the hollow trees and just leave the squirrels be. So. Let's see, Let's... habitat loss, pollution, overhunting, disease, uh, climate change. Uh, we don't have woolly mammoths around, which is a shame because I would love to hug one, they're just so fluffy. Uh, but we had a lot of very large mammals roaming America during the last ice age. Uh, I know I'm a big guy and the sun and heat is killing me, so I can only imagine <coughs> a thousand pound woolly mammoth plus trying to survive in today's heat um, and they did die off now the evidence to support mammoths were also pushed to extinction due to hunting as well um, but they probably would not have adapted well with the climate either same with a lot of the, the megafauna from the last ice age but i think that's most of the three that i want to cover so let's move on to observe wildlife my dogs are uh, not well, <laughs> but <laughs> I do apologize. Now, um, some wildlife that you might be able to see outside your window, if you can't go outside right now, is at night, raccoons. Um, they're everywhere. You can find them in the woods, you can find them in the suburbs, you can find them in the city. These cute little trash pandas are everywhere. Um, this is why you want to make sure you lock your food up at night and, you know, make sure you put a good lid on your trash can. But keep an eye out your window at night, you might see one walking by. Now, right now it is springtime and it's mating season for the striped skunk. Uh, they're everywhere. I personally have seen four and probably will see another one very shortly. Um, these guys are everywhere right now. Yes, they are nocturnal. But in the springtime, they're out collecting food, trying to eat because they've got little ones to take care of. So if you see a skunk, we all know they spray. Just please mind your distance. And I'd, I'd stay a little further away than six feet because they can spray about 20. So just with all wild animals, safe distance, about 300, yeah, 300 feet. 
Now, we got our squirrels. This is actually a red squirrel. Uh, one you're going to see more common around PA is the gray squirrel. About one and a half to two times larger than this. And it doesn't have that nice reddish tint to it. They're, um, they're more like this gray here. So, gray squirrels, they're, once again, just like the raccoon. They're in the cities, they're in the suburbs, and they're in the country. So, keep an eye out for them, and I'm sure you'll find them. Uh, many of you may have heard this one already. The red fox has been screaming up a storm, because, like I said, it's springtime. Everything's running around. Uh, so, at night, do keep an eye out. You might see one of these walking down your street. I know I've seen a few this year already. Now... If you're a little more woodsy area, you have a chance of finding a coyote. I do wish you luck. I mean, I live in the suburbs, and we have them around. Uh, just They're more skittish than even the fox. So they are a little bigger, but they don't want trouble. And if they see or smell you, they will be running the other direction. I guarantee you. Uh, and... The most common is the white-tailed deer. This is a very decent buck. Um, right about now, just about all the deer have lost their antlers. You still might see a few with them on. But the males will have the antlers and the females will not. Uh, keep an eye out for them. Now, why... Huh? That's a weird animal. Car horns. Never know when they're going to happen. So, when you are observing the animals, a couple things you want to keep an eye out for is, what are they doing? Are they eating? Are they birds picking up seeds or eating insects? Are they gathering nesting materials to take back to their nest? Are they alone? Are they in a group? Deer like herds. A lot of these animals like to be left alone. Uh, just things like that. Are they sunbathing? Are they napping? Is it too hot for them? So, just observe them. See where they're going. Try to figure out where they're going to, if they're going back to their den or things like that. But always follow from a very safe distance. I recommend 300 feet or further, and never interact with a wild animal. Right? Always please do any activities outside with parental permission and supervision. So, that was number four. So we are going to move on to number five. So we're actually going to kind of slide some of this stuff over because we're now focusing on plants. So number four talks about looking at a plant with a magnifying glass. Now, if you do not have a magnifying glass, that's okay. A lot of us have fancy phones. Now, you could take a picture and zoom in on the photo. Cameras on phones are phenomenal nowadays. But, I got this right off of my lilac tree in the back. And, we're going to take a closer look. So, right off the bat, I can tell you, by looking at the leaves... They look fuzzy, which is fascinating. Now that little hair you see on leaves is actually to keep them from drying out. It's to break the wind. Um, unfortunately, I don't think you'll be able to see it on the video, but that's why you gotta go and do it yourself. So the little hairs on the, the leaves is so when the wind blows over it, it actually creates a windbreak for where the moisture and oxygen releases from the, the leaves so they don't dry out too quick. Uh, if you notice some plants, if you have a cactus in your house or a succulent, they have very waxy, thick leaves. Uh, most cactuses don't even have leaves. They're, they actually do the photosynthesis through their stems. But all that's so they can survive in their harsh environments. Um, if you can't go outside and you can't grab a leaf off a tree, check your refrigerator. Parsley, you know celery, things like that. They're all plants. You might be able to see their cell walls and an onion skin or the little grains in it. But, all right. Some of the fun stuff is 
we've got buds and this is going to produce or would have fed and helped a branch to grow out from here so each little bud feeds the next growth so this allows for the piece above to grow now over here we have a node so there's a bud and a node on every piece and if there's scars down here from an old node so a node is where a branch would have grown or a bud was growing now the space in between so right here is what we would call an internode so you'll be able to see that there are scars on the branches and you'll notice that leaves have scales at the bottom fun stuff like that different plants have different leaves some have nice smooth edges some are deeply lobed some are sawtoothed so don't just look at one plant you want to compare and see what's different now you don't even have to just look at leaves pine needles pine cones the bark on a tree there's endless possibilities so and you want to make sure you write all that fun stuff down because you're probably going to forget uh, a lot of small details in plants and you do want to present this to your uh, cub master or your parents so and like I said I highly recommend looking at more than just one plant I know it, the requirements are very vague and you just you know look under a magnifying glass but really take your time and try to appreciate the beauty of the things that give us oxygen and celery snacks they're delicious so now, let's look at number six. What is this? Number six. Um, unfortunately, I don't compost. Number six is to figure out composting. Uh, not to actually do it, it's to learn the benefits and the process of composting. Uh, for those who do not know the term composting, it's to break down organic matter. Um, so things that were once living. Now, Ideally, composting should be done with leaf and plant materials. Uh, yes, meat does break down and decompose, but if you compost meat, it can attract bugs, rodents, and it's pretty smelly. And you really don't want that. So if you do decide to go and do your own composting, uh, YouTube has a long list of videos, but once again, for parental permission, um, you can look up how to compost on YouTube and there's some very in-depth how-to videos. Um, but when it, a plant dies, so all these nice little leaves, you would take this or your potato cuttings or your carrots or your leftover salad and you would throw this in you know, a heap or a container and it would start to break down. What a lot of people like to do is to take pre-existing compost or topsoil from their yard. Uh, what that does is introduces bacteria. Bacteria are decomposers and they're gonna break down all this leaf litter and strip it back down to its natural elements like calcium, magnesium, nitrogen, phosphates, all that good stuff that plants use to grow because what plants do is their roots spread out and they absorb all those elements right out of the soil, all that fun nutrients, and use it to grow and build. And then animals, or and us, we come along and we eat it. We eat the plants. And then we absorb all that. So it's part of us, it's part of the plants. Well, when you know things kick the bucket and they're laying out in the ground or in your compost heap, uh, moisture is very important. It allows for bacteria growth. You don't want your compost to dry out. And air. You need to till it. You need to turn it. So mix it up with a shovel or something like that. And that allows the airflow. And that allows for the bacteria and the earthworms and all those good creek crawlies to really get in there and thrive and break down your compost um, very fast. Now there is some risk to composting that you do have to be mindful of. Once again, parents. Um, is that compost piles do create heat. Uh, there's too much uh, it's, is it methane or nitrogen. One of the plant matters um, produces a lot of heat 
during decomposition. So do keep that in mind. Always check in on your compost at least uh, once a day, once every other day. Uh, try to keep it out of direct sunlight and don't let it just, don't put a tarp over and let it, you know, trap all that heat in. That can be very dangerous. Um, composting on a small scale for a garden or flower pots is important and much safer. Uh, so when all that breaks down and you put all that fresh compost into your flower pots, it, once you add the water, all those nutrients can be absorbed by the plants. So that's a quick overview of composting. Like I said, uh, parents, if you go on YouTube, you can find a lot of good videos on how to go a little more in depth. And if you're stuck inside, if you got a nice little spot on the back porch or something like that, you could start a small compost pile in, a, in about a bucket. Now, we are moving on to requirement seven. Requirement seven is the last requirement and something just about anyone can do inside. It's plant a vegetable garden or herb garden. Now, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. It doesn't have to be, you know, rows and rows of corn and potatoes and stuff like that. If you got the ability to do it, I encourage it. But we can start right here in our refrigerator with a lovely potato that I may have let sit in the refrigerator a tad long because it started to develop growth. Um, so the eyes started producing. Now what I'm doing is two toothpicks and letting it sit. Um, you do want to change the water fairly often. You don't want it to stagnate. And hopefully we will get some very nice fruit growth out of it and eventually I'll plant it in the garden. Now, if you don't have potatoes or you want something that grows a tad faster, you can go, take your old celery stalks, cut the bottom off, and hopefully we should be seeing growth coming right from the, the middle of this. I do apologize, I just started these the other day, so there's not too much you know, excitement. But I recommend a clear glass, something you're not using often. Um, that way you can keep an eye on the root growth. Other plants you can do this with are onions that are sprouting, if you want to put them in. They are bulbs, so they'll split eventually and produce more onions. If you go to the grocery store, a lot of them now still have those little seed packets, so you can grab them and plant them at home. Do a nursery. You don't want to put them right outside, right off the bat, because frost, and it's fairly warm at night, but you still can get a cold snap still, and you want to be mindful of that. You do want to make sure they get good sunlight and make sure you water just enough, not too much, and not too little. You need to do research on what you're growing because every plant requires specific amounts of water, sunlight, and certain nutrients and temperature. Uh, there's a couple other fun things you can do just by trying to regrow the stuff in your refrigerator. There's, once again, a bunch of helpful videos on YouTube. Uh, I do apologize. I, I only have these two for you. But, uh, those are the requirements of one through seven. Uh, once again, the first requirement is the only one that's mandatory, and you have to choose at least three of the remaining ones. But if you have nothing better to do and you're just laying around the house, I encourage you to go above and beyond and learn as much as you can. See if you can do all seven of them. So, um, I do apologize that we're not out and about. I'd love to see all this summer. And hopefully, a lot of you will be going to Muster Scout Reservation. So please stay excited, stay tuned for updates and all that fun stuff. And I will probably see you all next week. So, take care.